Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with the disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. The disability community makes up about 20% of the world population. That means about one in five people identify as having a disability. And yet disability is often forgotten in conversation. Priya Ray, an advocate and artist, created DIY Abled as a way to raise awareness of disability within society. But before we jump into the episode, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. I'd also like to invite you to my private Facebook group called Crip Chat Club via Zoom and sign up where you can join us to speak with us every Saturday live. I'd also like to ask if you like what you see here, please support us at patreon.com forward slash one leg up productions. Thanks so much for being with us today. I'm so excited to have you on Chair Chats. Um, you are part and a regular, and I, I would say you're you kind of taking on a leadership role within our Crip Chat Club via Zoom group. Um, and I'm so excited to have you finally here on Chair Chats because you're doing some amazing things that are moving and shaking disability in the world. And so we're going to just chat about that. So let's start out with you just sharing your story, how you came up to this point, and what was the inspiration for creating DIY Abled? Okay, but I want to start with that. I'm so happy to be on Chair Chats, Pauline. And I, you know, I'm so happy that in this pandemic, I was able to make some new friends, which you being one of them. So I'm happy about that. So my story is um, I had a spinal cord injury in 1999. It's at a T12 L1 injury. And for people that don't know what that means, it's basically a description of your spinal column, which is, so basically it's the tailbone area um, is where my injury location was. And um, I have an incomplete injury because, and I call it incomplete because I, I where I was damaged, I should really be completely paralyzed from the waist down, but I have a lot of, you know, like obviously the way my spinal cord was damaged. Um, I have a lot of strength in my quadriceps, which is the muscles in your thighs. And I have, you know, my upper body strength. And so with those things, it gives me a lot more independence in the world. So due to that, I was able to, um, get back to my life uh, that I had, you know, reasonably, of course, not exactly, but I was able to get back and do the things I was doing in my life before I had become disabled. Um, but before I did that, I actually moved in. I had my partner, Robert, who I'd been together with at that point, probably like I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years. I can't remember the exact amount of time. But um, uh, yeah, so we, me and him moved in with my parents and I actually lived in the basement of their house, which is like one of the most amazing living spaces I lived in. Like Robert and I were always like, I wish we could take this with us wherever we move. Cause it was like, it was just great. It was like an open, like an open design and it was just really accessible and um, it had an accessible bathroom, you know, so there was just like really great things about it, but you know, I didn't want to live in my parents' house and I wasn't really, um, I wasn't into Hershey, Pennsylvania. I, it just wasn't my style of, there wasn't a lot of, um, art and music. It was just was different than the art and music scene that I was looking for so I didn't but if I could have found that there in Hershey I would have stayed there but we tried for two and a half years Robert and I literally searched for people to see if we could find that connection but we never could and then after I had my injury 
all my friends had essentially moved to the Bay Area. And one of the things they kept saying to me was like, oh, you have to move to the Bay Area. It is the most accessible place in the country. And I was like, oh, okay. And at that point, I don't know, I just had my injury. It, had, it hadn't even been like a year and people were saying stuff like that to me. So I wasn't really thinking what is accessibility? What does that even mean? I didn't even know what that meant really. Um, and then, you know, I was at Shepherd Center where I did my rehab and they were very explicit about teaching you about the ADA and what your rights were. So I knew all about that, but they didn't alert you that most people don't really recognize these rules and laws or it's a law and people don't really you know, abide by these laws. So a lot of times you're going to go to places that aren't accessible and you have to figure out how to do it or tell them like, hey, you need to make it accessible. But I didn't realize that because Shepard had kind of didn't really, I, and I don't know, I, I forgive them for that because it's like, everyone's newly disabled. So they're like, I have rights. I can, you know, you want to give people hope and, you know, inspiration. So they believe they can continue on after becoming paralyzed like that. So I understood why they did it, but I kind of wish they had informed you, Hey, that sometimes you're going to have to speak up for yourself. And I don't know, just prepared you for that. So like, if I felt if they did, I would have like been like, so can I, are there stairs to every, like, you know, I would have asked, do businesses have stairs? Do, are there wide enough? Like, can I get into a show space that has a flight of stairs? Do they have an elevator? You know, like I would have asked these questions, but because I wasn't really aware of it, I didn't. So I was a little apprehensive to move to the Bay Area at first because it's so expensive. It's one of the most expensive cities in the country. So I had friends in LA and they're like, why don't you move to LA first and then move to the Bay Area if you want. I was like, okay. So I did move to LA and I actually liked LA, like, but you know, all my friends are in the Bay Area. So I was just like, we were just really focused on getting in the Bay Area. But in hindsight now, I feel like LA would have been a much better space for me because like they had um, this, transportation service called access which uh drove people to it wasn't just doctor's appointment they would drive you anywhere it was like a taxi service for disabled people so it was really great i actually you know while my partner robert was at work i would i went you know i went to the de young museum i went to all these places that you know that were like famous about la by myself that I would have never, you know, I could have gone with Robert, but it was just fun going exploring it by myself and doing that. So I, I really like that. And the Bay Area, there wasn't, I felt when I moved there, there wasn't really as much support like that for the disabled community. And, and it was really hard to find out about what was available to you. And the way I really I found out were through other disabled people I met and they were like, oh, you know, you can get Robert to get paid to be your caregiver. This is the number you called. And I was like searching for this number. I couldn't find it. You know, I looked for it online, Googling. I just couldn't find anything. And so that's really how I found out was through the disabled community, you know, because we watch out for each other. So they're all like, oh yeah, you need to get him paid for to be your caregiver. This is the number you call, they'll do it. So I was like, okay. So, so that was cool i i enjoy living in the bay area mostly because these are the reasons i enjoy living in the bay area because robert did get paid to be my caregiver which allowed him not to be stressed out to get another he did have another job but it was like you know like 20 hours a week which allowed him to like help me and i didn't really drive at that time and so he could you know take me places and stuff and so I did like that about the Bay Area, but what I did not like about the Bay Area is that it was absolutely not the most accessible city in the country because I've actually lived in a lot of cities in the country, so I know that. And um, the thing about the Bay Area that is cool is you can fight to get an, you know, for accessible parking spot. And in fact, the neighborhood I lived in, West Oakland, 
like down the street from me was this like fraternity like a black fraternity and I don't even remember what the name is but you know I was always going around the neighborhood and they were like hey hey can you tell them that you come here and you need an accessible parking spot here because we've been asking them and they haven't come and uh, we were just hoping maybe if you do it they'll do it and I was like okay so I actually did do that for them because you know I of course want their disabled patrons to be able to access their place so you know, so I felt like you could fight for disability rights there and people would actually make it happen. But the idea where the community was watching out for the disabled wasn't really happening. People didn't really care. So like I would go down a sidewalk and there'd be a curb cut at one end and the other end didn't. And I have to back around, go down a driveway, go in the street, you know, so it was just like the navigation was doable, but you know, like a little a bit of a pain in the neck because of it so so yeah that was the one of the things I found about the bay area while you could fight for your rights and people would actually do something and listen like the government too um the community wasn't really thinking about how to include disabled people in their community so that was like something I didn't really like because the bay area was like you know for people of color, LGBTQ, women, there was all this stuff going on there, but, and, the, and there were disability rights activists there, but I unfortunately was never able to connect with them, which I feel kind of bummed out about now that I left there. I'm like, oh, I wish, because now I found out about some people. I'm like, gosh, if I could have only met up with this person, we could have done some stuff, but you know. What year were you in the Bay Area? Um, I was there from, 2000 let me think okay like 2004 till about 2011 oh okay I, w- I i left the bay area in 2006 and you were in yeah. oakland area i was in san jose so yeah, maybe yeah. that like the bay area is so vast um yeah, and yeah, yeah. i think you know like any city there are its positive points and then there are its drawbacks um, or way, areas they can improve on. Um, but I'd like to be, I'd like to understand a little bit more about how you came up with DIY Able. So yeah, so like that happened and then I hadn't thought of DIY Able yet. And then I ended up, because then what I, what I was really having trouble with was the medical world because I started getting pain in my body that now I know it was, spasticity and neuropathy, which is common to people with this, with a spinal cord injury and other disabilities as well. So I, um, I just wasn't getting the medical help I needed because doctors were saying, me, oh, you have irritable bowel syndrome, you have this, like so many tests. And I call it like the medical hamster wheel, like you just keep going around and around and around and they're not really giving you solutions. So I, and then, you know, my parents lived on the East coast and traveling those long plane trips was, I don't know, it was getting, getting to me. And so I was just like, I just realized I'm not really going to be able to keep doing that. It's going to be harder. So I was looking for a place, a city that had a medical facility, like more like a rehab center that would advocate for you and give you physical therapy and stuff like that. So I was looking and I, and I researched and I found Asheville. And so, and we have friends in Asheville. So that's why we kind of chose Asheville. And so we came here and then both in the Bay Area and in Asheville, I had re-entered the DIY scene, which is a scene I had been a part of before I had my injury and it was mostly through music and somewhat through art. And, um, you know, and I just, I didn't realize how inaccessible the scene was because I wasn't disabled. So it was just something that never crossed my mind. So, um, I just started getting frustrated because I, I was, I'm in a band and people, and I think because of my personality, even though I'm in a wheelchair and I just like, I don't complain about things. I just am like, okay, how do I, like I'm at a show and I have to get in somewhere or even if I'm going to a restaurant or something, I'm not like thinking, all right, this is inaccessible. This is not ADA compliant. I'm more like thinking, how do I get in here? 
because I want to go in here. So like, then that's what I'm doing. And I figure it out and I go in and people don't realize that aspect that I, you know, that I'm figuring out. They just see me in there and they're like, oh, Priya's here. Yay. We love her. Blah, blah, blah. And so after this kept happening, I would say a good 10 years of this happening to me, I was just like, Oh, this is annoying. I got to do something. So then I first I what I did, because I am an artist, I'm creative. I came up with the name DIY able came to me and I was like, oh, that's a great name. I don't know how I'm going to use it yet, but that's I, I love that name. So I'm going to keep that name. And then I would just go around telling people, I don't know, I just like yeah, DIY able and I didn't really know what I was going to do. So then um, I don't know. I didn't really, I wasn't writing. I hadn't really started a website. I wasn't really going out and doing activism as I am now. So what really pushed me into it was in 2016, early in 2016, I think probably in March or January, January through March sometime, um, the state of North Carolina passed something called a bathroom bill, which is a uh, bill that said people that um, were transgender that identified with a sex that was not on their birth certificate could not use the bathroom they identified with. So, so if they were born and they were considered a male on their birth certificate, they would have to use the men's bathroom and vice versa. And, you know, um, the LGBT community lost their minds, which they should have. I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't have done that. They really like, and all, everybody like wasn't up in arms, not just the LGBT community, but all the supporters and allies and every restaurant and business were as support were like, our bathrooms are all gender. Our bathrooms are all gender. So then I'm, I'm not an LGBTQ person. So that stuff doesn't really affect me, but of course I, don't think it's right. I feel like people should be able to use whatever bathroom they want to. And I'm not, I don't have problems with that. So I think it was a, you know, it was a silly law to be passed and they had the right to be really upset about it. But it was upsetting to me that these businesses were taking time to say, hey, our bathrooms are all gender, but they don't even have an accessible symbol on the bathroom. They don't talk about the accessibilities of their bathroom. So I found myself going around town a lot, being like, hey, I see your bathroom's all gender. That's really cool. But is it accessible? And I did this on purpose because I knew people weren't thinking about it, but I felt like they needed to be thinking about that because everybody needs to use the bathroom. And to be quite frank, I have a spinal cord injury. I do not have control of my bladder. So if I can't use the bathroom, I will be urinating on myself. So, you know, people that are trans, they can still go into the bathroom that, you know, they identify with because no one's really going to be policing that. And, and even if they did have to go to use a bathroom that they didn't identify with, they could still use the bathroom, which is really what the bathroom is for to be able to take care of your business. It's not really like about how you identify, you know, as, as a gender, which, I mean, I understand maybe you identify as a man or woman and then you're around a, the other sex and you feel uncomfortable being there. And I totally understand, but feeling uncomfortable and not being able to use the bathroom is a way more uncomfortable because then you've peed on yourself. And then you're like, if you want to go do other things, you're kind of like, uh, what do I do? And I could like sit in the car and do it, but that's just like, it's difficult to do that in a car. And that's like a solution. People are like, make sure you bring a change of clothes so you can change in the car. And I was just like, no, that's difficult. They should make accessible bathrooms. So I don't even have to worry about that. Or that I, in, or if I did have an accident like that, I could go in the bathroom and change my clothes in there because there's more room for me to do that than in a car. So, so 
Yeah, so I got upset and I would go around town and I actually had these DIY able stickers I made. So I would tell them, I'm just going to go put the sticker on your bathroom. So people that are disabled know this is an accessible bathroom. And the businesses were like, okay, yeah, go ahead. So I was like, okay. But yeah, I, it would just really bother me. So that's like when I started to begin doing what I would call activism, where I started talking to people about why communities needed to be, and I use the word inclusive because that was what the LGBTQ community was using. They were saying by that bathroom, they were, by the bathroom law, they were not being, the community was not being inclusive to them. And that's true, but they also weren't being inclusive to me because I couldn't use their bathroom because it wasn't accessible. So I decided from that that verbiage and dialogue that was happening to go in and talk about how to be inclusive to the disabled people in your community. And so I would actually go into the LGBTQ then you, you know, they had collective bookshops and stuff. And I would go speak about it because I knew none of them thought about disability because I felt, I don't think, I mean, there probably are people in the LGBTQ community in Asheville that are disabled, but I haven't really met any of them and none of them have come out to me and been like, hey, you know, like, so obviously the identif identity of being LGBTQ was more important than, or more important to them than the identity of being disabled. Because maybe, I don't know, maybe there weren't as many obstacles for them in that way. But yeah, so then when I went and started informing it and it was it was good because I did start seeing a response from that community, like people would like, and they were like younger kids. They were, I'm like 52. So they were like in their twenties and I was in my twenties. So I, I know what that's about. You're just, you know, in this state of confusion, trying to figure out who you are as a person and and then, and you're not thinking about disability when you're a young non-disabled person because it's just not something you think about. I think there, what you were describing is like a difference between preference versus need. Like right. if the bathroom is not accessible, then there is no way we can use that bathroom. It's not like we prefer bathrooms that are accessible, which is very different from like, no, it's impossible. It's like we're both in power wheelchairs um, most of the right. time. Um, it's like a two inch step is the same size as a mountain to us. Right. So, um, and I also get that people are so consumed with their own specific causes that they don't see how it can translate to other um, experiences and other other identities um, in their community. And so with DIY Abled, I think you're doing something really good because you're taking other people's causes and saying, hey, we'd love to be part of your cause too. Would you like to be part of ours? And yeah. And the reason I do that is because I feel that America, you know, like um, we're living in this really tumultuous time right now where people are fighting half the country feels this way, half the feels the other way. And I just feel like all minorities need to kind of be there for each other. And, and I, you know, I remember, I just see like in the crip camp and that era of disability rights activism, um, you see pictures of a blind person hanging out with a person that maybe had a spinal cord or someone that has cerebral palsy. And they were like all a little united. They weren't like, I, I don't know. I feel like people's right, the human rights of people, whether you're an indigenous person, person of color, a woman, LGBTQ, or even poor, like um, we're all being split apart. And I think we need to unite. So that's why I like to use DIY able to talk about disability, but to be like, hey, and disability affects all of you. So why don't we all come together and try to fight together? Because I think it would be much more, um, I don't know, we get a lot more accomplished that way.
Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a big believer of allies and, and yeah, uh, coming together to, for, in cooperation to help one another. I have a question for you in your experience. Uh, I understand that disability has many layers, but if you yeah. had to choose one, do you feel the barriers for disability is more structural, systemic, or attitudinal? I feel attitudinal because once the attitude change, then the systemic and the structure will change. So I think attitude, and, and that's why, like my belief is like, I, I, I have this, you know, you've heard me talk about this. I have something what I call is the trickle up theory where you start at the bottom and go to the top. And I think that's the same for activism is you start with your community. And once your community is like understanding we need to include disabilities, the, this person, this person, this person as well. Like we need to figure out how to make that happen. Then the attitude changes, then systemically you elect people that are gonna do that. And then structurally, when the government and the attitude of the people are there, then the structure will change. So that's why I think the attitude is kind of, for me, the most important thing to work on. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and just by being in the community, once people know me and, and they're like friends with me, it's like they want, oh yeah, like we totally want to make our house accessible. We totally want to make this accessible so you can join us because you're amazing. And so <laughs> I'm sure and, like- And it's the same with me, like uh, like this local business record store where we play, it's totally inaccessible. But, you know, I like the inaccessible places because there's a community there. Like, cause it's like the way it's done, it's like a person starts a record store and then makes a show space in the back. And it's just like a very grassrootsy type of way of presenting art and music. So I love it. I just hate that they're inaccessible, but I also know that they don't really have a choice because they don't have money. And, you know, so one of the things that I think is really great is when my friend owns a record store with a show space where I played a lot and it's not inaccessible as far as I can get in, but it's inaccessible as far as the space. So it's kind of small. My wheelchair just fits through the aisle to, or did just fit through the aisle and I could get to the back where the show was. And, and a lot of times I didn't just stay in the show space because it was too crowded. And if I didn't like the band, I just didn't want to sit in the room with it loud. I just go talk to people outside. And that was what was great because you could actually go and talk to, you could either watch the music or go and talk to people. And so, yeah, I, I loved it, but it was really inaccessible. And um, I went and visited you know, his store during the pandemic and because he had gotten assistance for his business because of the pandemic, um, which was like, you know, essentially a loan, like a 30 year fixed loan with a really super low interest rate. Um, he got it and he's just like redoing, revamping the whole place, making it more accessible. And the first thing he said to me when I came in there was like, Priya, the bathroom is going to be handicapped accessible. And I was like, all right. I was like, awesome. Because that was like one of the big problems with the DIY spaces. Bathrooms were never accessible. So I would just have to reserve myself to urinating on myself, which really sucks because I don't know. I think there's some like animal instinct, like you never get used to that. It's something you never feel comfortable with. So, well, and I it, mean, it strips you of your dignity, the thought of it, like, and I'm sitting there and, you know, it was just more like nobody else knew that was happening to me. But um, for me, for me, I was just like in the dignity too, because it feels so horrible when you're peeing on yourself in the public and you can't really go change it and you just gotta deal with it and you know and I, I'll tell you this funny story I when I was in Oakland I played a show there it was inaccessible and when I sing 
you know, if I can't empty my bladder, you know, because the sing pushes on your bladder. And I literally feel myself peeing on myself when I sing sometimes. And I'm like, oh, God, this is horrible. But yet I'm singing. I'm doing my thing. And then I'll hang out with people. And then I, I love the people there. So I was like hanging out with them and dealt with what was made me uncomfortable. I pushed it aside to hang out with them. And then I went, I decided I was going to go home. And I have this really good friend, Brontes, who is uh, a gay black, maybe, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he's, it seems like he might've changed his, or I don't know. I don't know what's going on with him. If he's trans now or what's going on, but like he's black, a black gay uh, activist and in, in a band and he we just loved each other and I was like I'm leaving now Brontes I'm going home he's like oh Priya no I love you so much stay I was like listen Brontes I have peed on myself and I have been sitting in my own urine for hours that is what I've done for you and now I have to go home because I don't want to do that anymore and he's like oh my god I love you so I was just like, but it was great because I just you know, I said it in this funny way, but, you know, but it was the truth, but, you know, like, he was just like, oh, shit, yeah, okay, yeah, go home, oh, sorry, I yeah, no, but, yeah I but, but he was like, oh, go home, so I was like, okay, yeah, so, you know, so, yeah, I just thought that was a funny story, and that's, that's so really great. how I deal with things like that, because the sacrifice we make for people, <laughs> you understand how much I sacrifice for you, <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was fun, yeah, um, what could people do in their own local area to help advocate or raise awareness of disability? The first thing I think is if you are disabled and you can actually get out into your community and you can drive yourself and be out there, I think you should definitely represent the disabled people like, you know, that we aren't all helpless. We do want to go to places. We want to enjoy social activities. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I know there's a lot of disabled people that really can't leave their house. And I don't know, that always makes me feel horrible because I feel like we need to start like a social thing for people like that. But, um, but if you can physically get out into the world and be present as a disabled people, I think that's when you're changing the attitude the attitude aspect of society because then they get to know you and then they really like you. And then when they start realizing like, oh, wait, this isn't accessible, this isn't right, you know? And then that's when people start getting emotionally invested in the disabled community. Yeah, I think that's a great, um, a great point. I remember when I had to stop driving because my, my old van, that was custom made for me able to be able to drive was no longer safe to drive. I was stuck at home for like three and a half years. And when yeah. I was raising funds, it was like, I positioned it as it's not just about me. When I go get to go out there in the community, I get to affect people's perspectives. Um, right. And I do think it, it's important that if you can, then go, go out, out and be part of the world and be part of the community because that's when change will truly happen. Yeah. Um, one last question. And I know this is more of a, an, like a futuristic visualiz visualizing question, but it's important for us to be able to like, you know, have an idea of where we want to see society go. So I'd like to ask you, what do you hope society would look like in relation to disability once the work is done? Well, I'll first say, I don't think the work will ever be done. I think we'll move progress because there's always gonna be something that someone doesn't think about, but in an ideal perfect world, I would love communities that are building themselves to immediately think about accessibility and just it's just there. They don't have to like, we don't have to go and say, hey, you didn't make this accessible. Like, it's just like part of the, the uh, it's just part of the mindset of people like, uh, you know, where they're like making something and like, oh, and how do we include disabled people? Like, it's just an automatic thought like it is for other minorities. Um, and yeah, I just would like to see 
disability embraced rather than looked down upon. I, I meet a lot of friends that have meant more mental, like I feel I have some friends that are on the autistic spectrum, but they're so embarrassed about that, that they're not really embracing that. And because they're not embracing that, they're still suffering. They're not getting the help that they need. And so I just would like to see that, that, um, the framing of what disability is of not as an embarrassment, but just something that is like someone's born black or someone is born brown like me or someone's born a woman or they're born LGBTQ. It's like, it just is what it is. Um, there's nothing you can do to change about it and you shouldn't be embarrassed about it. And society shouldn't look at it as a negative a bad thing like I don't want you know people are like I don't know if I could deal with the way you I just don't know how you do it and I'm like well and I my answer to people is like you just don't know you don't know how you would deal with something like that you don't know how you would deal with something like that until it happens to you and you'd be I think you'd surprise yourself at how you would actually deal with it yeah and that's my answer to people when they say things like that yeah. Well, and you had to do it, right? You weren't yeah. disabled and you had, you went through it and you came out on the other end, just fine living your life on your terms. Yeah. And people think like that I'm an incredible person, but, and I, you know, I, I will admit I have like a more positive mind. So, you know, it has to do with my mind too. I, a lot of people get more depressed and I, so I'm, I'm not really a person that has a propensity for depression. So, you know, so I'm always looking like, like when I was in the hospital, I was like, okay, how will I do everything I want to do from, I was like immediately trying to figure out how I was going to do what I was doing from a wheelchair. And my parents were more like, oh, Priya, <laughs> you're going to have to, you have to move home and, you know, get adjusted. And I was just like, no, I can't move home. I'm 29 years old. I'm an adult. Adults don't move back in with their parents. But, you know, in reality, I'm glad I did that because it gave me time to kind of figure out how to live. And, you know, I had the support of my parents. They didn't charge me rent and stuff like that. So, you know, I was lucky to have that. And then when I was ready to go out in the world, I had awesome parents that were like, believe me they were worried they were they were probably freaking out so bad but they were just like okay just call me every day <laughs> and i did because I, and i call my parents every day but yeah so they were very i had a really supportive uh, support system that were like yeah go out and do that stuff that you want to do and do it as a disabled person so well and i, I was think you had that I think the way that you handle other things, like I, you weren't thinking about, is this place accessible? It, you think about, well, I want to go into this restaurant. So how can I? So it's not a matter if, um, if you can or cannot, it's a matter of how. Um, and I think that type of thinking has served you well. Yes, I think so too. Thank you, Pauline. Yeah. I'm so glad someone else thinks so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm with you right there. That is exactly how I think. I'm not going to let anything um, stop me. So um, we need yeah. more of those people to step out and be leaders and show us the example of what can be done. And I think you're doing that beautifully with DIY Abled, whether it's going out in your community and talking with people, knocking on each door, um, or even doing through your art. I know you have a Patreon that um, you have art uh, that you give to pe people, um, to your supporters. So if you're watching this and you'd like to support Priya Ray, um, go to her Patreon and she's all up on Instagram and she's part of Crip Chat Club on Saturdays. So Which everyone should come and join. If you're disabled, it's a great place to meet a lot of awesome disabled people. Perfect. Well, and this is just the beginning of what Priya Ray has to offer. I believe that there's more to come from her creative mind. So I'm really excited to be part of her life and have her be part of the community we created through Crip Chat Club. So join us if you're watching this. Priya, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing yourself and creating DIY Abled. You know, it's not easy being a leader and standing up and knocking on doors and saying, hey, don't forget me.
right? So yeah. um, it, it's it's a big deal. So thank you for that. Um, You're welcome, and I'm so I have to say I'm so honored to be friends with Pauline, and I love Crip Chat. And it's like I make time to join Crip Chat. Like I, it's like you know you have to make time in your life for things, and I. Crip chat's like, okay, Saturday Crip chat. I got to do that. That's a no brainer. So, so I love it. I'm so happy. <laughs> I, wish I could give you a hug one day. One day we will hug. I promise. I know, <laughs> I know it will one day. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to come knocking gonna... on your door and be like, are you accessible? <laughs> it's like, you can come in the door. I don't know where I'll put you, but <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like the record store. You can come in and you can come out. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Priya. And thank you guys for tuning in. I'd like to hear from you and, and I'd like for you to comment below. What do you do in your local area to raise awareness about disability? It could be something small. It could be something big. Whatever it is, I'd like to know. So get engaged with us. I want to thank you for joining another episode of Chair Chats. And I would like to remind you to please subscribe and share. Join our private Facebook group called Crip Chat Club via Zoom, which we just talked about. And if you like what you see, support us on patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you so much. And until we meet again, be blessed. Mm -hmm.